Nation. Here's Lamar on a run. Welcome back to the week 14 episode of Crushing the Competition. Returning triumphantly from my week off, I am Justin with you as always, my host, my co-host, Tony. Tony, how are you? Good. I'm good. I miss you. Uh, I'm glad you're back because we got the dynamic duo going, so I'm ready to <laughs> talk some fantasy I missed football. you. I missed you too, man. It was nice to uh, kind of come off of a very hectic work week for us. I'll tell many people, especially if you don't know, listen to us at home. Generally, if you don't see me for a week, it's because the Florida Panthers have a home game on that day. So heads up early, Tony. You got a home game next Tuesday as the Florida Panthers host the Ottawa Senators at FLA Live Arena at 7 o'clock sharp, which makes it difficult for a Tuesday recorded show. Uh, but it was a hectic week. It was nice to relax a little bit on Sunday. I listened to the show that you guys did in the morning and then got to watch the Dolphins win their fifth straight game. And that's good news for everybody. Uh, we love to see that. I'm sure you got to be pumped about how, that, that's, how that's been recently. Yeah, very much so. Uh, I wish they kind of weren't under 500 still when they were on this streak, but no complaints. I'm happy with the team where they're at. I just hope it continues and you know, the end of the season doesn't really blow up in our face, but we'll, we'll find out. Yeah, one of many coaches, Brian Flores, I feel like, that has that MO for ending the season very strong. Mm -hmm. Few teams have been on that vibe recently. The Lions getting their first win. The merciful bye week for the Browns was good news for me and Wyatt to not have to watch any football. So yeah. we'll see how it goes. I think basically everybody except Bills fans is feeling halfway decent about their week right now rest in peace bills fans we apologize bills mafia not a fun game no. for you in the snow last night but here we are um so let's get you ready we aim to help you crush your competition here on this show and this uh marks a very important time for the show and for tony and i discussing the show prior to this we want to acknowledge that many of you in week 14 will be experiencing your first week of the playoffs whether that's a league that breaks to the quarterfinals or a league that has two week semifinals and final matchups, I think we're going to have a small segment of people who are already getting into the playoffs or at the very least are getting ready for playoffs next week. So we're going to try and keep everything in the show themed towards that end today. Before we get started, I got a wonderful playoff related story for you. Are you ready to hear it? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. First week of the uh, Florida Panthers work league was last week. We go to the quarterfinals in week 13 then 14, 15, 16, 17 for two weeks. I mean, two week finals. I go in as the three seed with most of my team gone. First pick, Devontae Adams on a bye. Second pick, AJ Brown on IR. Third pick, Robert Woods on IR. <laughs> Gus Edwards was on this team. I think Travis Etienne was on this team. Jerry Judy was the only player I picked in the first seven rounds that I had active and available to use for last week. So it, the writing was on the wall that I was going to get smoked. Yeah. I spent all week with Wyatt trying to come up with something to do. And somehow Jedi mind tricked the person that I was playing against, my direct opponent, who knew that he was going to beat me by about 30, 40 points to trade me Alexander Madison for Devontae Adams straight up which sounds like the worst trade that anybody has ever made. Unfortunately for this poor soul, I beat him in the quarterfinals by having Madison on my team and not oh. on his. <laughs> Madison slotted into the spot that James Robinson had been in, about 20 points out of Madison, two out of Robinson. That 18-point differential is what ultimately got me over the hump. Now I just have to figure out how to navigate the rest of the playoffs without Devonte adams but yeah it's winter go home sometimes you got to do crazy things yeah so hopefully everybody at home you know you got to do what you got to do you ever feel like you're staring down the barrel in a league that doesn't have a trade deadline and you're about to get eliminated you got to do some crazy stuff that's probably my favorite fantasy trade that i've ever made is getting rid of Devonte adams for two weeks of alexander madison and having it be the absolute correct move i'll never be able to say that again so i'm off to a good playoff start I want to make sure everybody else gets off to a good playoff start as well. That, I think, Tony, is going to be really tough 
A lot of bye weeks and injury news floating around. Obviously, it's a little bit different on an 18-game schedule. Many of us only play fantasy seasons till week 17, but that does mean that in week 14, we're still facing teams on a bye. So people are going to be without the Patriots this week. They'll be without Jonathan Taylor. Uh, so lots of people on buys, and I know we're dealing with a whole host of injury issues. So let's start there. Yeah. First and foremost, the Thursday game, if I'm not mistaken, is Minnesota hosting the Steelers in the Dome. Isn't that right? That is correct. So that should mean I'm firing up Madison for a second straight week here on Thursday. I've heard at this point there's little to no chance that we're going to see Dalvin Cook ready by Thursday. Are you hearing the same thing as well? Yeah, I don't think they're going to risk it at this point. I feel like that division, if not – or the NFC, if not for their division, the Vikings still have a chance at playoffs. So I, I feel like they'd rather save Dalvin when Madison's being just as efficient. So they'll probably yeah. just roll with him. I think we'll maybe talk a little bit about Madison and Square Scare Prayer, which we're going to do as a little bit of a longer segment here today. But I am curious what you feel about him going against a Steelers defense that was supposed to be great against the run and has been a little bit iffy. Uh, we may also be without Adam Thielen in that game. It seems like it's going to be a pretty quick turnaround for him to be ready by Thursday. So let's just say hypothetically, it's Madison, Cousins, Justin Jefferson. How do you feel about maybe acquiring and using Osborne if you have to for this week if he's basically the second pass catcher? I don't hate it, especially with, like, you, you got to think about all those buys, and then especially there's a lot of wide receivers banged up right now and some even on COVID lists right now as that's kind of sweeping through the league. So you've seen K.J. Osborne's ceiling earlier in the season. He had a huge game, so it, it wouldn't surprise me if there's people playing him in their lineups this week. I've thought about it. I don't know where I stand quite yet. It's going to take another couple days to roll around in the head, and that'll probably be a game-time decision on Thursday. But I don't think it's too wild either. Uh, another stud running back. We haven't seen Alvin Kamara for a couple of weeks. <sighs> Honestly, at this point, Tony, I can't tell you if we're going to see him this week or not. It's too early in the week here on Tuesday night to know what's up. If he plays, he's a smash play against the Jets. It's just, I think, a case of maybe having to monitor it. If there's any real injury related question that I think is relevant for this Jets and Saints game. We saw a really, really good fantasy day out of Taysom Hill throwing and running the ball last week. Now he kind of had to be the star of the show. The Jets are an excellent matchup for anybody, but there is always the fear that if Kamara comes back, Hill's going to essentially Mac Jones it and just spend the whole game handing the ball off. Where do you stand on this? Would you want to play Taysom? if Alvin Kamara is in the lineup against the Jets? Probably. Um, I, I Sure, he may not have the 25-point week or whatever he had in standard leagues last week, but I still think he's efficient enough to get you fantasy points as your quarterback. And I think Alvin Kamara probably, in a way, helps him because, let's be honest, Alvin Kamara versus Ingram – who you, whose run game are you going to respect more? Probably Alvin Kamara. So when he's back, yeah, so when he's back in the backfield, you got to think that they got to – they have to stop his rushing ability, which then you would think in turn opens up passing lanes for Taysom. So I think that would sort of benefit him because he is basically a mediocre passer right now. He's not flashy. He's not terrible. He's just kind of like middle of the pack. So, like, for me, I'm comfortable playing Taysom still, even if Kamara's back. Interesting. Uh, as we continue to move through running backs, Daryl Henderson was active. We did not know that it was only as an emergency play uh, last week. So many people have played Daryl Henderson to the tune of zero. Well, Sony Michelle got all the work. I think this is another one that people are going to have to monitor throughout the week. I want to make sure people are thinking ahead now, especially those of you in the playoffs. If you do not also own Sony Michelle, you definitely want to have a backup plan ready for Henderson as that is the Monday night game. So if we find out at 7 o'clock on Monday evening that Henderson's active but is still going to be limited, you better have Sony Michelle on your bench so you got a replacement. I'm sure James Conner and Chase Edmond are not available in most leagues. Maybe you got to dig as deep as uh, Eno Benjamin for the Cardinals to try and get a replacement. My official recommendation, at least for this point for everybody, is to play somebody else if you've got the ability to do so. I've used quite a lot of Daryl Henderson this year. It's been really effective for me. I have some teams where I'm going to play, for example – Elijah Mitchell, if he's healthy, uh, and Alexander Madison and leave Daryl Henderson on the bench because I just can't risk that I'm going to get another zero out of him after what I saw 
last week. So make sure you're all thinking ahead and checking the news as far as Daryl Henderson goes. Another truly questionable back is going to be Melvin Gordon. Now, I personally would love to see Melvin Gordon miss this game just because the Javante Williams shares have exploded in the absence of Melvin Gordon and we're uh, sitting on this home matchup here against the Lions. I guess the real fantasy question, right, is if Gordon plays, are you comfortable playing both of these guys against the Lions or do you worry that they'll both go back to being slightly above mediocre? Yes, but only because, like, you have to think about how many running backs are injured right now. And you know, Javante has been successful even with Gordon on the field. His ceiling drops. I'll give you that. But like we saw um, before this week, week 13, no, week 12, they were both playing the game. Javante had like 19 points. Yeah, he took so, over at the end, didn't he? Yeah. And so like he, his ceiling, you know, he scored that 29, almost 30 point week this past Sunday without Gordon, with Gordon in the lineup, the ceiling just drops. He's still got a low floor, but, like, that's what you expect out of a flex player. Like, you know there's a low floor, but you really hope there's a high ceiling. Yeah, so, I think like, I'm with I, you on I, that one. I would be comfortable playing Javante. It's just less comfortable putting him in, like, an RB2 spot. Speaking of potential RB2s, Kind of a weird week out of the other, Jay Williams. So on the other side of that game for the Lions, it does look like DeAndre Swift is also going to be questionable. I'll tell you this, I own a lot of DeAndre Swift. And from what I have seen, sure, it's a long week. They play on Sunday. I do definitely think this is a case of early week optimism. I think Sunday's way too soon for Swift to effectively return from the injury. I am mostly doing conjecture here. So nobody quote this as gospel. You know, I am the amateur that I am, but my expectation is that Swift is not going to be available to play. We're going to get another dose of Jamal Williams. I thought he would have a substantially better game than he ended up having last week. He himself is returning from injury, but he is somebody to keep on your radar as well. If you are somebody who owns any of these guys, if you're worried about Melvin Gordon, if you're worried about DeAndre Swift, you've got the Giants and the Chargers as another four o'clock game. There's a couple handcuffs, guys like Booker that maybe you can keep on your bench as a flyer if you have to take one of those guys out at the last minute. The 49ers and the Bengals are going to play at 425 along with the Bills and Buccaneers. So you're going to have some less than ideal options. But if you want to stash a guy like Singletary or Giovanni Bernard in hopes that you can get past the one o'clock window, play Swift, then you find out at the last minute he's not going to go. You got to have some pivots ready to use if necessary. And there are a couple out there on Sunday night, Monday night, and those late games. So keep an eye on that as well. As far as pass catchers go, we just uh, had a week without Darren Waller. What are we thinking for him this week? Am I going to have him returning to my tight end premium squads where I drafted him so high, or am I going to be yet again disappointed? I think it'd be, I'd be surprised to see him play Sunday. Uh, Jake and I talked about it last week. IT bands are like, they're difficult to injure, injure. And while they may not be a serious injury, it's like, it's, it's a lingering one. And it's one that needs to heal a hundred percent before you're really like able to be out there and be yourself. And that, that's that I'm just kind of pessimistic about Darren Waller being out there on Sunday. If you have Foster Moreau, i I'd probably hold on to him and don't drop him for like other waiver claims this week unless you have a better tight end option. But if you already have Foster Moreau in your lineup, you probably didn't have a better tight end. A better option. tight end option. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I'd hold on to Foster Moreau, basically. Yeah, I feel you. I think that's exactly what I'm going to do. I have one league where I actually played both he and Derek Carr, as ineffective as that was. Uh, Last week, it was over Knox, which turned out to be the right play. You know, I didn't really realize at the time it was going to be 648 (laughs) mile-an-hour wins. Uh, But that's kind of where I'm at. Like, if those are the guys that you're talking about, the Jonu Smiths, Gerald Everett's of the world, hold on to Moreau, see what you got. Uh, Maybe you have Moreau and Logan Thomas, and now you're without Logan Thomas, another guy who's going to be gone for the rest of the season for this injury report as well. So I would wait as well. I would see what happens for the week. I mean, I'll tell you this. If Foster Moreau may have a decent game, if we're going to be without Kenyon Drake, who is also now done for the season, very interesting Twitter, Instagram, social media post from Kenyon Drake about protecting the players. If you haven't seen it, go find it, everybody. It's a very interesting piece of perspective from him. Uh, But no Drake, no Waller. 
I mean, how quickly are we running to play Josh Jacobs and Hunter Renfro if they're the only two guys who can healthy be healthy enough to make this trip to Kansas City, right? So I know we're not a DFS show, but that's my two cents in the DFS world. It can't be that expensive to get a Hunter Renfro and Josh Jacobs, and there should be a ton of work headed their way this week if we're going to once again be without Darren Waller. Um, some other pass catchers. I know we mentioned in passing that Thielen is out. Uh, also without Corey Davis, who is now done for the rest of the year, unfortunate season for him in hindsight after a lot of preseason buzz that kind of came up out of nowhere. It's a little bit sad because now I feel like this is the umpteenth time, as my grandma would say, that we've had this conversation about Corey Davis. We're in the preseason. We think he's elite. And then now here we are. He's done for the year. And I think I've maybe used him once or twice yep. throughout the season and have been mostly disappointed. Uh, other more noticeable pass catchers. Keenan Allen on the COVID list. Any chance he makes it back for this week, or am I just planning to go this week without him? I don't actually know that for a fact, but if he's vaccinated, there's a chance. He just has to test negative two days in a row. And I think he went on the list yesterday. So I would imagine we won't find out until tomorrow evening if he was to you know, test negative two times. Then tomorrow night we'd find out. But otherwise, we won't find out till Saturday or Sunday. Well, we'll have to play it out and see how it goes. I know we've been through many an instance this year with quarterbacks that have cleared on Saturday yeah. to play in games the following day on Sunday. So I got to keep an eye out for what's going on with Keenan Allen. Debo Samuel missed last week, could be coming back for this week. I think signs were leaning towards him being able to play this week. You heard anything different? Uh, no, uh, but I will say that like it's a groin injury. So... I said, I mentioned it with Jake last week, like gro groins are important for wide receivers. There's a lot of motion that goes on in the wide receivers hips when they're planting, accelerating, making moves. So if he's not hundred percent, I really doubt they're going to throw him out there, but you never and know. It's probably triple as important for a guy like Debo who's constantly yeah. in motion and is running the ball these days about as much as he's catching the ball. So really rough injury to come back from, but we'll see how it goes. One piece of positive news for you before we get into some larger discussion about players, Julio Jones activated off IR. That is just a godsend for Titans fans and for people who've been holding on to Julio Jones this whole time. Yeah. It is interesting that he's going to come back to a team that is without Derrick Henry and without AJ Brown. When you make the move that the Titans did to get a guy like Julio Jones, it is for him to step up and help your team win. And this part of the season where you started out hot, you got a ton of injuries. Now it's slowing down. I don't even know if I can play Tannehill against Jacksonville at this point. It's gotten so tenuous in Tennessee. What is your take on this situation? Are we going to get almost out of nowhere, a vintage effort from Julio Jones? Or is, are we going to see another week where they're just all kind of meh and disappointing? Um, I'm leaning towards the vintage Julio Jones, uh, ma really? mainly, yeah, mainly because they put him on short-term IR, which I think is them saying like, hey, we want you to just relax, heal up, get healthy, and come back. Be ready for when we need you yeah. to be ready. That's a good point. I hadn't really thought of that. I hope that that's the case. It would be really nice just for, for him, for the Titans, for everybody for him to come back well, but that'll be a very interesting situation to see how that develops. Well, so there's also like the flip side where they need pass catchers and they are in the head of the division right now. So like there is the flip side where maybe they're rushing him back, but I think I'm, he's a veteran and I feel like Vrabel is going to be smart enough to be like, Hey, sit out until you're ready. When you're hundred percent, tell us and we'll get you back on the field. So we'll, we're going to see how it plays out, but I, I think it's the later. Or the latter. So. Yeah. I'm I'm pretty I, I mean, I think you're right. I hope you are. It'll be really interesting to see because they do have what I guess eight and four and seven and six. They kind of have that like weird game and a half sort of lead on the Colts, and the Colts have a bye this week. If yeah. you can beat Jacksonville, which you should, you go to nine and four, they're seven and six. You're kind of hitting the part of the year where it seems as if you're gonna be able to win the division. So it'll be interesting to see how they use him right like you yeah. would figure you got to pull out all the stops you cannot cannot lose a game to Jacksonville no. at this time of the year in the position that you're in so all right let's move on to what is going to be a much longer version of my personal favorite segment square scare and prayer for what is most likely to be the next 
four or five weeks, we're going to do this version of Square Scare Prayer with more players involved. Feel free to get at us and any comments on YouTube, send us direct messages on Twitter, post to us, whatever you want to do. If there's any topics or Square Scares and Prayers that you're interested in hearing about, uh, but we want to provide as much value to you folks as home as possible. So we want to take a more in-depth look at some of these players that might be coming across your radar in the most important weeks of the season. So before we can move forward, we always have to take a second to look back. So let's take a chance to be accountable for last week. A pretty solid overall two and two in week out of the boys. We got two squares, Terry McLaurin that didn't quite hit, Jalen Waddle that did. Do you remember who who was your pick? Who was Jake's? I mean, I don't want to admit it, but I picked Terry McLaurin. <laughs> did you? Yeah. Jake, you, it, Jake took your boy. I would have thought for sure the other way on that. I couldn't remember who had picked two either because I was going through everything so fast. But that's <laughs> that's a good pick. Jalen Waddle has been yeah. unbelievable yeah, the yeah. past couple of weeks, the way that he cemented into the offense. For what it's worth, man, I'd have, I'd have been right with you having McLaurin on the square list yeah. for last week as well. It just seemed like the perfect matchup for him. Uh, then we got Najee Harris as a scare who was able – to hold it down. It took a lot of volume and a lot of effort, but he had a good week. And yeah. then on the prayer side, Hunter Renfro, who absolutely delivered. I expect him to deliver again. Who were you the author of? Najee. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. really good week. Really good week out of Jake stepping in to just carry the torch. You got to remember that, because there's a good chance it's going to be Jake filling in for me next week. We got to see if he can keep keep that going a little bit longer. But He's got to carry this one's gonna be This one's going to be tougher, man. We might have a good 10, 12 players by the time we're done talking here today. So it's a very good chance we're not going to look quite as sparkling at the end of it, but let's see how it goes. So first, on Thursday, very interesting game where the Steelers are going to be in the Dome to take on the Vikings. In a world where we are not seeing Thielen, where we're not seeing Dalvin Cook, I think the first thing that I wanted to make clear to everybody is that we got to treat Alexander Madison as if he is Dalvin Cook. He is by all means a square play. Yeah. I imagine that there's some people out there in the world that maybe have a guy like Madison on their bench, but they're just not as familiar with him or they don't quite realize why he's had a few games this year that are huge, but most of the time he doesn't have enough. So if you fall in that category where you listen to us and you just aren't exactly sure, Alexander Madison is one of these guys that is a very important backup to a star running back. When Dalvin Cook's healthy, he doesn't see a ton of work. Dalvin Cook is out. He sees all the work. Yep. The only thing that you maybe worry about is, is he going to score touchdowns? Thielen's the main red zone target for the Vikings. So with Thielen also out of the picture, it's kind of just a smash play that Madison's going to see both a lot of volume and have red zone opportunities. You got to get him in your lineup if you have the ability to do so. On the other side of the ball, I might be a little more scared about Steelers pass catchers. That's maybe... Nothing new, but if you are sitting on a guy like Chase Claypool, I don't necessarily know how good I feel about it for this particular week. Anything different out of you or any other guys that stood out to you? I think Justin Jefferson is a mega square play. I mean, yeah, I don't care if he's getting triple covered. He's one of the best receivers in the league right now. So, like, I, like it would not surprise me if he, like, just bombed a 30-point league to start for the fantasy week or a 30-point yeah. game to start the fantasy week, but also, like, maybe temper expectations a bit because he is the only target that's, like, been on the field consistently that'll be playing Thursday night. But I'd love to see just a massive game on Thursday night from Justin Jefferson. Yeah. Well, let's transition over 1 o'clock on Sunday. The Browns are going to host the Baltimore Ravens at First Energy Stadium. What, what do you got on this game? Anybody that stood out from here to you? Yeah, so I'll tell you right now, my start sit article, Chubb's going to be my start running back of the week. And I just I, – I explained it in the article, but, like, I just think – I got this gut feeling it's going to be, like, a heavy, hard running game from the Browns, and Chubb's going to do his thing, show the elite level back he can be, and just completely erase what the game was two weeks ago. I mean, that game was gross on both sides of the ball. The Ravens played terrible offense. Browns played terrible. It was just, like – it was almost like, get this game over with. I need to go to bed. I don't think it's going to be the same on Sunday. Chubb and Kareem Hunt, I think they both have solid weeks. Um, on the other side of the ball, actually, Marquise Brown is going to be a sit from me. I just see the Browns kind really? of locking things. I think the Browns are going to lock things down and just kind of shock everyone this week because, like, the Ravens have been doing their thing. They did all right. They barely lost to the Steelers. 
I just, it kind of feels like it, that's been the NFL this year. There's been so many games that have been unpredictable and you didn't see it coming. I just got that feeling with this game this week. Oh, I hate to say it. I might be the exact opposite. I know. I know. You're in the but, camp where you're a Browns fan, so I get it. <laughs> yeah, but it's because I think the wheels are starting to come off a little bit. It, it's not that Chubb doesn't have the talent to do that. It's just yeah. like, we're just not going to give him the ball to do it. It just fair. It's the correct play. It's the right play. We just won't. We yeah, just won't. That's fair. And as the game script starts to get away a little bit, it makes it a little bit less likely. Now, listen, like there's no way, especially in a playoff week, that any of you should have the balls to sit Nick Chubb. Exactly. Please, God, no. Like, take your seven points and loss with Nick Chubb in the lineup before you do something ridiculous and hop onto the waiver wire and grab Ty Johnson because he's a Jets running back and we want to play. Right? Like, there's yeah. not a lot of guys at this point in the season where you would even be able to hypothetically replace Nick Chubb. I just yeah. do worry a little bit about it. Um, I also kind of fear – for the sit of Hollywood Brown, just because I don't, I don't know that the Browns have the defensive personnel to bring the sort of blitz that we've seen teams bring against Baltimore recently that have given Lamar Jackson such a fit, right? Like everything was moving along swimmingly until on a shitty Thursday night in Miami, the Dolphins were just like, we got nothing left. Everyone go after him for three hours. And it just kind of short-circuited everything, and he hasn't looked like the same guy since. It just, for us, all that pass rush is generated off of the defensive line. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that we can bring the secondary and linebacker help and looks and disguises that is going to make a difference for Lamar Jackson. Uh, To be fair, I didn't necessarily know that the Steelers would be able to do that last week, and they did fairly effectively to keep yeah. that game mucky as well. So I'm hoping that this doesn't turn out to be another gross game like it was before, but I don't know for sure if I believe that. Yeah. Uh, it makes me feel better because I have some Nick Chubb and I haven't felt great about it, so it's nice yeah. to hear you tell me that he's going to be your play of the week. Uh, but we'll see how we go there. Next one up, another game. We've talked about this one a little bit already, but the Jags are at the Titans. I think there's a couple of things that stick out to me. One in particular, we're probably benching James Robinson. So he's got to go on the scare list for people. If you have even mildly competitive options to James Robinson, he's probably a guy you got to get out of your lineup. He was effectively benched for last week. If you haven't seen the story, go check it out. He was healthy. He wasn't healthy. He was practicing. He wasn't practicing. On Thursday, there were reports that he didn't practice. Then there were conflicting reports that he did practice. He wasn't just doing anything. People started asking, is it a suspension? What the hell's happening? He's out there Sunday. He warms up. He's dressed. He's barely used. He spends almost the whole game on the sideline. After the game, they ask him, what's going on? And were you benched? And he said, like, you can see the stat line in all essence. Like, basically, you know, you make up your own mind, but I wasn't out there. None of that says good relationship and things are going well. I, I'd be careful about that one in particular. On the other side of the ball, Tony, one big question that I have for you. I know we've talked a little bit already about Julio Jones. Regardless of whether Julio Jones does or doesn't play, are you falling on a prayer or scare side for Tannehill and for Westbrook? I think it's Akine. I've only heard the name a couple of times. Tougher for me to pronounce. Yeah, but the other know. young wide receiver that's out there, I could see it going both ways. I could see people being into these guys because it's a matchup with the Jags. I could see people being out on these guys because it just hasn't worked for the past couple of weeks. Where would you fall with them? Um, with Julio, he's projected 11. I, I think like anywhere from that 9 to 13 range is where I'd be comfortable saying what he'll produce this week. So basically for me, it's like a flex play. Not too confident okay. in it, but like – I do think he's healthy, and I do think he'll he'll get – I don't know if hyper-targeted is the correct word, but I think he'll get a good chunk of targets this game. Outside of him, I don't don't think I'd touch anyone else in my lineup unless you just are completely depleted with injuries and you don't know what else to do. But Julio would be the only person I'd be comfortable putting in my lineup, and it's barely a flex play. Well, you gave me just like the most beautiful segue you could have right there. Our next game – the Las Vegas Raiders head on the road to take on the Kansas City Chiefs. I am facing that exact decision in the playoff league, in fact. The one where I'm uh, in the semifinals this week. My two quarterbacks are Carr, are Tannehill. So if I'm worried about Tannehill, who I've played over Carr for most of the year, 
how do we feel about Carr? Is he a guy that, to me, he's kind of the same category. He could be a scare. He could be a prayer. We've seen people throw all over Kansas City at the beginning of the year. Yeah. You know what I heard today, which absolutely blew my mind? Since week six, if you take out weeks one through five, since week six, Kansas City is the leading scoring defense. They've generated the most points yeah. off turnovers, not fantasy scoring, but they have had the most takeaways turned into points in the NFL week six through week 13. That's a major turnaround from what we expect and what we saw earlier in the year. How are we feeling about Carr, especially in a world where it probably doesn't involve Darren Waller? I like him a tad bit better than Tannehill, mainly so, because... He's a mini prayer. Yeah, that's that's what I would say. I, li I like the way you said that, mini prayer, just because he still has Josh Jacobs and he's been utilized in the passing game more and more, I think, like the past three weeks, as I've seen that dynasty Jacobian guy flaunting on my timeline. Um, but I do think Josh Jacobs is getting better at the passing game and they pretty much have to incorporate it him incorporate him into it right now because they're without Darren Waller. They lost Henry Ruggs. Deshaun Jackson is 40 years old and tears a hamstring yeah. as soon as he goes off the line. You've got Renfro, which is fine, but Renfro's not going to have 200 yards receiving. Sorry, that's just not going to happen. Um, I wish. With Yeah, I know. With Tannehill not having his stud running back and he's got a mixture of Dontrell Hilliard and Dante Foreman, it's like, is there is there much success in the passing game set up for Tannehill? I really I really don't think so. And I think Carr, even despite the matchups, I do think Carr has a better day than Tannehill. So I, I personally would rather play Carr than Tannehill this week. Let's flip to the other side of the ball. It doesn't matter how much they struggle. If you have Kelsey Abahomes, you're playing him and you should. You're going to live and die by those guys, especially with where you yeah. drafted them. Uh, a little bit of a different story for me. I personally have both CEH and Daryl Williams on my scare list. I'm kind of out completely on the Kansas City backfield right now. Just don't want to – I don't want to go down in the playoffs because a Kansas City running back delivered a four-point game to me that I felt like I should have seen coming from a mile away. Yeah. Are you with me on the scare for them, or are you feeling more confident? Mm, I think I'm with you. They both had 11 points last week, so it's like, who the hell is getting the touches? Who's being – who's on the field most of the time? Like, it's one I'd of almost things. rather see one go for 13 and one go for four. Yeah, exactly. Then you know who to play, but now it's like, well, one of you could get 25 this week. Who is going to be? Like, I don't know. It's There's probably a lot of people that have them and have to play them, but I, I know you're not comfortable. <laughs> yeah, I feel the same way. Uh, all right. Speaking of people you're uncomfortable playing, I don't think there's a ton to go over. Saints are in uh, the Meadowlands, if that's still where they play, to play the Jets. One another one o'clock game on Sunday. Uh, we talked already about Taysom Hill. There's nothing to talk about on the Jets side. Just get the hell out and move on with your life. I don't Not think the Carter's back this week. Not true. Elijah Moore did well last week. Listen, if Elijah Moore is not a square for you at this point, then let – let Tony and I just nail that in right now. Yeah. Play Elijah Moore every week. There's no way that you have three or four skill players who are better than Elijah Moore on a week to week basis. It, it listen, if it was any team that wasn't the Jets, I'll say this. If any other team that's not the Jets and not the Lions, someone had had the past two or three weeks that Elijah Moore had had with different quarterbacks and different moving pieces in and out of the offense, we would be singing their praises. Yeah. But because he's a rookie and because he plays for the Jets, we're all kind of trying to keep it in arm's distance. Don't play Elijah Moore. Be very comfortable with it. The Saints are going to stuff the run against good teams, let alone yeah. against the Jets. They're going to have to throw the ball. Um, for me, it's a little bit more about the other side. Now, like we talked about Taysom Hill earlier when we did our injury roundup. I'm a little bit more concerned about Mark Ingram because he's a guy where I've seen friends, colleagues who own him be very disappointed with what they've seen out of him, especially what was it like a either last week or the week before with no Alvin Kamari had a pretty disappointing game. Yeah. People kind of look like they're running to bench him. I'm still putting him more in a prayer category for this week, just because the jets are so bad yeah. at stopping opposing running backs. Uh, do you feel like I'm jumping the gun there telling people to go ahead and just plug in Mark Ingram? Should I have him a little more to the scare side? I, I agree. I think he should be 
he's you said he has a you you said you have him as a prayer. Yeah, I can't really say square for yeah. him, I suppose, but like he's a lot closer to a square for me than he is to a scare. No, I'll I tell you agree. that. Like I would agree. I'd play almost any running back against the Jets on a week to week basis. Yeah. I mean my my feelings on Miles Sanders are well documented yeah. and I was very happy to play Miles Sanders right. against the Jets last week, so I'm sure as hell going to be ready to play Mark Ingram against him as well. Um Probably one of the most interesting fantasy games of the week, Tony. Cowboys go on the road to watch. I mean, that's just an interesting football game all around. Yep. The suddenly six and six Washington football team yeah. will host the eight and four Cowboys. Who sticks out to you here? Um, Dak and every pass catcher on the Cowboys, I think they're going to have an electric passing game week. Um, okay. I, I don't think of... anybody's really thinking that they would sit Cooper. Or no. Lamb. They're going to be in everywhere. But you are going to have a lot of people out there who listen to us who've got Gallup kind of on the bubble. Yeah. Are we going prayer on Gallup for the week? Yeah, prayer. But I mainly see him as, like, a very good flex play, basically. Yeah. That's probably where you drafted him. So if you're someone who's in a good position and you have him where, like, you have a solid lineup and he can t- be tossed in as a flex play, do it. I think he's going to have a good week. Not great. Not bad. Good. Now, I guess this might not necessarily fall in square scare prayer category because nobody should even be considering sitting Terry McLaurin. Uh, But I'll go, for what it's worth, a square for Terry McLaurin on this game as well. I do not know if we're going to have J.D. McKissick back for this game or not. That is a important passing weapon, despite the fact that he plays running back. An important passing weapon for Washington. We're back to having no Logan Thomas. Curtis Samuel is getting there and I still for one think that we're going to have some productive games out of Curtis Samuel at the end of the year here but I it's just one of those things if you look up the numbers you'll see that the Cowboys have given up a ton of passing yards on the season they've done it on not a lot of attempts and completions all that comes together to give you a pretty large yards per catch average the Cowboys have one of the worst yards per catch defenses as far as the passing game goes to me all of those kind of peripheral stats suggest a big game for McLaurin he's the guy that they're going to take shots to when they do it and if he's in an advantageous position to have one if not two decently large passes come his way he's got all the makings for a hundred yard game and one where he's got a good chance to catch a touchdown with no Logan Thomas there as well uh so I'm pretty high on McLaurin this week I imagine you probably are too you're generally pretty high on McLaurin just as a dude. Um, but yeah, that's that's my take on that. I think if you want to play the Cowboys and I want to play Washington, we're just rolling out full offense in that game. So I guess we should be smashing the over. Ooh, well, who do the, you not like? Uh-oh. On the flip side, I have this written down. Antonio Gibson's going to be my scare play. That's uh, terrifying. Dallas is third in run defense. And I know it's disappointing because Antonio Gibson uh, – you know, people who are rostering this whole year have been waiting for kind of like that that breakthrough, like getting 20 points yeah. a week. And we've seen that like three of the past four weeks. I just don't think it's in the cards this week. You got a division game. They know that Antonio Gibson's hit his stride and that McKissick's most likely going to be out. Like they're going to focus on that. They're going to focus on Antonio Gibson more than they are on Heineke, in my opinion. And I don't think that's going to bode well for Gibson. Does he hit yeah. like that 10 point mark? Probably, which is fine. You know, like, you're getting double digits. It's better than nothing, but it's not going to be like that 20 point week we've seen recently out of Gibson. That's where I'm at with him. Nice. All right. I'm going to give you a couple of quick hitters and then we're going to get to the four o'clock games. Make sure that we stay on time. Uh, the last two one o'clock games, I just don't think there's a ton of stuff to go over there. The Falcons are on the road at Carolina. If you have Cordero Patterson, you're playing him. Yeah. If you have DJ Moore, you're playing him. If you have anybody else, you're sitting them. The only real note that I will give everybody on that particular game. And I don't know how much I subscribe to this, but it is out there in the world. So it's worth acknowledging that there's a fairly large subset of people that do believe that with McCaffrey now out and remember the Panthers were on a bye last week. So the last we saw of them at week 12, McCaffrey leaves that game and Abdullah looks substantially more involved in the offense than we thought he might be. And it raises a very large red flag on folks who had just been faithfully rolling out Hubbard in lieu of McCaffrey earlier in the year. 
So if you are that person where you reacquired or held on to Chuba because he did well for you when McCaffrey was out earlier, give it a good think before you roll him back into your lineup because there is a chance that there are going to be some other faces and other activity in the backfield that don't allow him to see the volume that he saw a little bit earlier in the season. Um, the other game we're going to kind of stream past is Seahawks at Texans. Yeah. Feel comfortable Brand feel comfortable playing Brandon Cooks as a flex if you have to. Shouldn't be much more than that. If you have Lockett, if you have Metcalf, you ought to be playing them against the Texans. Everybody else is a mess. Yeah. You're good to play Russell Wilson. This game is exactly what you think it's going to be. Please, and I hope I don't eat these words later, please do not go out and hit your playoff wagon to Rex Burkhead because there's nobody else in the backfield and think that you're going to outsmart everybody with an 18-point Rex Burkhead week against the Seahawks because the defense is no good. Just careful, get on out, do what you got to do. Now, 4 o'clock games. A lot more interesting games going on here. We've talked quite a bit already in the injury news about the Lions and the Broncos and what to expect at that game at 4.05. Any other players' details or things that you want to throw in on that matchup? Um, I think – uh, Almond Ross St. Brown is a solid play this week. Uh, That's a good prayer call. Yeah, I think he's he's shown with uh, Goff that they got a little connection going and like a team that's always going to be losing and or fighting to get that win as we saw last week. He's a really good flex play, really, really good prayer play this week. Interesting. Uh, maybe one scare I'll contribute just because it came to my attention earlier. I, I know he's kind of on the waiver wire anyway, but uh, let's go mini scare, I guess, as we're going to call it, on Teddy Bridgewater. Yeah. Because he's a guy who is probably sitting on your waiver wire, and a lot of you may just look at the matchup against the Lions and go, well, hell, if you're in my boat, for example, where your quarterbacks are Tannehill and Carr and you're worried about both of them, why not go grab the guy that plays the Lions? The Lions have been a little bit better in the past couple of weeks. They had a good showing against Baker and the Browns. They won a game last week. Kirk Cousins was okay, but not great. For large stretches of that game, he was at very low numbers before it kind of kicked in at the end. I We haven't seen anything good at a Bridgewater in the past couple of weeks. That's probably fool's, fool's gold, so stay away from that one if you can. Uh, pretty interesting game as far as, I think, the Chargers side of the ball goes, but the Giants are going to make the trip out to California to play the Chargers. Anybody in that game stand out to you? No. I mean, if you have Saquon, you're playing him just because you waited how many weeks to play him? Of course he's going you're to be committed. in the lineup. But outside sure. of him, no chance. Jake Fromm, potentially a quarterback. Unless he Love has it. unless he has some kind of like crazy like Justin Herbert experience where he's just slinging the ball, I there's no chance I'm playing any yes. other than Saquon on the, on the Giants. But – for I the am Chargers, you're running your normal guys. I am running to get Jake Fromm in the dynasty leagues right now. Are you really? I am ready to pick him up and trade him for a third round pick after this uh, game when okay. it turns out he's serviceable. Uh, no, I, I've always kind of liked Jake Fromm, so I'm interested to see how this goes for him. I'm glad that he's got a shot to play. I still think it's going to be horrible. Uh, for me, the square for this one is Mike Williams. He looks like he's healthy again, finally, and he's getting some targets and. It's, it's a little tough to dissect, especially with the amount of football I watch, which is not as much as I wish it was. But what I feel like I'm seeing is that middle of the season where even I was using Mike Williams as a guy who was on the scare list for me pretty frequently, he wasn't healthy. And when he's not fully healthy, he's not fully getting open. Yeah. And that's why the targets came down, because Herbert is smart enough to recognize that's not the space I'm used to seeing Mike Williams in. I'm not going to throw the ball there. And I watching him now be healthy the past couple of weeks, I think is starting to connect the dots for me that he's ready to go. It's also one that I want to note for folks, because if Keenan Allen doesn't play, even more so a reason yeah. why you probably want to get Mike Williams into your lineups. Uh, it just... He's that kind of guy, man. Like a lot of people took Mike Williams to be their backup fourth receiver. And often you maybe struggle to keep that guy in the lineup when he hasn't produced for you for a couple of weeks. You want to go with the bigger, more well-known options. But I think this is a week where you got to do what you got to do to get Mike Williams in there. Um, maybe the game of the week for me, just because these two teams have been so up and down and I'm so curious which way their seasons are going to go. 425 in Cincinnati, San Francisco on the road to play the Bengals. Who sticks out to you here? Well, 
T. Higgins is my wide receiver play of the week. I think something about whether like teams are acknowledging Jamar Chase more now. I'm not Seems sure. Seems like what, it. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure what changed, but T. Higgins and Joe Burrow are on a stride right now. So I think he's a, uh, he's going to be a square for me this week. Uh, Joe Mixon, I think he's a solid play regardless. Uh, for the yeah, sure. Yeah, for the 49ers, like you said, if Elijah Mitchell's healthy, you're rolling him out there. Um, pass catchers, Ayuk, I think he's he'd be more of a scare for me this week. Um, I agree, yeah. I agree. I could see him on a lot of people's prayer list for this week, but he is one that I was going to say, I don't know if I'm willing to die on that hill. Yeah, and so that's that's bad. I mean, Kittle's obvious. Uh, Jimmy G is actually my sit quarterback of the week, so I'm a little worried about Jimmy G this week. Uh, but outside yeah, of that, nothing really that's else gross. worth. No, Tyler Boyd might be a scare, but I feel does, like it's... does it bother you that Joe Burrow's hand looks kind of like if I put my hands <laughs> together because it was so swollen on the side? I don't know if you got a chance to see the picture or any of the game on Sunday, but it's uh it's gross. It looks like someone shoved three golf balls <laughs> into his hand. Yeah. Legitimately, it's it's horrendous looking. I don't know how he was finishing that game on Sunday and just simply throwing the ball and then kind of like screaming each time he let go of the ball. It was a little bit intimidating. Um, I thought that he was a little less effective than I would liked him to have been, and I think it was because of the hand. Yeah. Are you worried about that this week, or you're just, if the Bengals say he's healthy, I'm in? I would think if the Bengals are saying, like, he's good to go by, like, Saturday, I'm fine with it. But if if it's, like, a game-time decision type scenario, I'd be a little bit more worried. Okay. All right, one more 4 o'clock game. Bills on the road to play the Buccaneers. This is a massively interesting football game. Oh, yeah. The Bills, especially for folks who may not be aware, the Bills lose this game on the road to the Bucs, and in all likelihood, we're going to move into Week 15 with the Bills being on the outside of the playoff picture. They are, if I'm not mistaken, the seventh seed right now, which I never – thought that I would see this whole Patriots as the best team in the AFC thing is just throwing me through a loop because I just do not believe in that by any stretch of the imagination. But the Bills have a tough game against the Bucs. If they can't win it, all of a sudden now they don't control their own playoff destiny. And that's a scary place to be with a few weeks left in the season. From a fantasy perspective, Josh Allen and Stephon Diggs are in your team. The question I have every single week when I get ready for the show is Knox, Sanders, Beasley, Singletary. Are they scares? Are they prayers? It, do you have any faith that any of these guys hit for something for Buffalo this week? I think Knox is going to be a prayer for me. I'm not, I'm not scared to play him, but I want him to have like that 20-point week that he's produced recently. But I still feel like in a game like this, where there's probably going to be scoring on both sides, regardless of how good these defenses are, they'll still be tossing the ball, which obviously digs. I think he's fine. Sure. Um, Knox, going to be a prayer, but I still think he's a solid play. Sanders and Beasley. Beasley would probably be another prayer, but just barely. I feel like he hasn't produced recently. I don't want to lie to you guys, so I'm going to go check that. Um, <laughs> no, but... it's kind of average. It's just kind of is always average. I guess for, for my two cents, I do agree with you on Knox. I'll take Knox on the prayer list. I'm going to put the rest of the pass catchers on the scare list. Uh, Gabe Davis has been coming on a little bit more recently, but I don't even have faith in that. Like, I think I'm just probably out on the pass game. Uh, I'll take the other side of the ball there. I definitely think, right? Like, there's no way you sit Tom Brady. There's no way you sit Chris Godwin. For me... Mike Evans is still fine as well. I assume most people feel that way too. Fournette is going to be a guy that I'm going to highlight as a square. He's been producing for the past few weeks. And generally when someone is producing, people aren't thinking about taking him out of the lineup. But I do know that this is one of those weeks where you're going to look at Leonard Fournette in your lineups and you're going to see that like little red mark next to him because the Bills have been a good rushing defense. And I know that can scare people sometimes when they look and they see the big 
the big bright red thing, letting them know that Buffalo's good against that player and that they should sit him. And he's not projected for as many points as some of the other guys in your lineup. Cause a lot of us just look at the ESPN or Yahoo or sleeper projections. And that's what we go off of. I just, to highlight for everyone, he's he's great. He's catching a ton of passes. The floor on Leonard Fournette right now is excellent, yeah. and it's often coming with a very high ceiling. Regardless of what you're seeing, you got to keep him in your lineup as well. And I'm also going to go square on Gronkowski. It's taken me a while to come around on it, but he is seeing an ability to give you a very solid tight end score, even when he's not catching touchdowns. Yeah. And that was always the fear. If you didn't get a touchdown, he wasn't going to be useful. He's proven, especially over the second half of the season here, that he's not that guy. So you should feel comfortable playing him regardless of what the matchup statistics look like as well. Uh, that takes us to what I expect to be a Sunday night blowout. Chicago Bears and whoever is their quarterback is going to travel to Green Bay. Who sticks out to you here? Um, Darnell Mooney, I think he's going to be fine. Had a little bit of a rough game last week, but they also play the Cardinals, who have an exceptional defense this year. Monty. Oh, the Packers have a really good defense, too. I know, I know. Very underrated. But you have to think it also is a division game, and there's always something about division games where, like, the Bears could come out and show out for absolutely no reason. So I, I'm kind of under the impression that, like, if Andy Dalton's out there, it's going to be just – we're slinging it. We're going to okay. feed it. We're going to feed it to David Montgomery as much as we should. But Andy Dalton, red rifle, throw it. Yeah, I feel like the Bears showing out is Andy Dalton gets them to 17 points. Hey, if it gets you fantasy points, that happened on what, Thanksgiving? It was like, what, 14 to 10 or something like that? And Darnold Mooney had 18 You still points. had a solid eight. Yeah, yeah, you really that's did. fine. It's it fantasy, can not real football. It's fantasy, not real football. Okay. All right. That's a good, that's a good point there. Um, on the other side, I know we really haven't seen anybody in the green Bay pass game. That's not named Devonte Adams that we could rely on. There's no tight ends to be had there. Lazard and Valdez Scantling. There's nothing we're seeing on a week to week basis to predict them. Uh, I can't in good conscience recommend that anybody goes and picks up Randall Cobb and hopes that they have a good day out of them. He may have a very serviceable day, I suppose. Yeah, I but- agree with that. For example, if you're really in need of a player, go see if you can play K, uh, KJ Osborne, right? Yep. Yeah, go see if you can play KJ Osborne for the Vikings on Thursday against the Steelers before yeah. you try and play a guy like Randall Cobb. I think you would have more success doing something like that. Uh, for me, the real question is, what in the world do I do with Dylan and Jones? So on one side of that coin, Tony, I think we're going to have Aaron Jones owners who need him to produce and are very scared that he's not going to be healthy enough to produce. And he's playing in a late game on Sunday where they're probably not going to have a serviceable replacement for him if it doesn't look like he's ready to go. If you own Aaron Jones, are you planning on playing him come hell or high water this week? Because that's kind of what you have to decide when it's a late game like a Sunday game. Uh, Yeah, I would. He, You drafted him top eight probably in your leagues. Like you can't not, if if he's trending towards being active, you can't, not play him I mean that's just the way your team probably is it's fantasy football and we're at the point in the year where you're you got to play those guys that you've invested in and well on the flip side of that one we got a lot of people who have invested very little either free agent pickup or a late pick in AJ Dillon and have watched him just be excellent for them the past few weeks I'm sure there's a lot of question in folks heads about if they can feel comfortable playing AJ Dillon with Aaron Jones back I plan on playing A.J. Dillon on a couple of teams. I don't know if I'm maybe on an island on that one. I guess he would have to be in the prayer category because it's not like he's a square guy. But I think I'll take A.J. Dillon as a prayer against the Bears for for my money. You agreeing with that one too? Yeah, I kind of see Dillon and uh, Jones as kind of like a Kareem Hunt and Nick Chubb scenario. Both of them can produce fantasy points. So if they're both on the field, like literally – if you have both on your team, I think I'd be comfortable playing both on a roster. Just because That's really I, think, interesting. I think the Packers have figured out a way to like incorporate both of them into the game plan. Mm-hmm. And it kind of in turn produces fantasy points. It's worth noting, like we're also hitting the time of the year where you generally see that. Yeah. This happens every year. You have your AJ Dillons who are slow at the beginning of the year and then they figure it out. 
You have your Javante Williams who are slow at the end of the year, and then they figure it out. Yeah. It's not just a case of the player figuring out. It's the player, the lineman, the coaching staff, the play calling. It's everything involved starting to come together for some guys like that. And I think we're hitting that part of the year now where it is perfect, perfectly reasonable for Jones and Dylan to shine together, for Gordon and Javante to shine together. It can happen yeah. like that. Uh, last game here, Monday night, another real big game. Rams on the road to play the Cardinals there in the desert. There's just a wealth of options here. Obviously, if you have Hopkins, if you have James Conner, if you have Kyler Murray, you're for sure. Yep. You're for sure locking them in. There's some question about whether Chase Edmonds can come back for this game. I guess all I'll say there is if Chase Edmonds comes back, don't play him. If Chase Edmonds comes back, still play Connor. Don't be dissuaded off Connor just because yeah. just because Chase Edmonds is back. The rest of the pass catchers, the Zach Ertz, Rondell Moore, AJ Greens of the world, yeah. the Christian Kirks of the world. Anybody else in that list that you would want to have a prayer on, or are you looking to play somebody else instead of those guys? Um, I know Zach Ertz is going to be my sit tight end of the week. Um, I just – he didn't have a good showing coming off the bye week no. against the Bears who really aren't all that outstanding on defense. With a fresh-looking Kyler. Yeah, and then they're going to go play the uh, Rams who have an above-average defense for sure and maybe still getting yeah. things figured out, but – the Rams are kind of trending up right now, and I don't think I'd be comfortable playing Zach Ertz. Maybe, maybe Christian Kirk as a flex desperate play, but that's probably about it. So Kirk would probably be a prayer. All right. Other side of the ball, we know you're playing Stafford, and you should. We know you're playing Cooper Cup, and you should. Uh, kind of in the injury news, I already gave you my two cents. I don't think you play Henderson or Michelle. If it was a one o'clock game, different story, but it's not. It's a Monday night. I'm probably off of both of those guys just because there's too much uncertainty. And if you don't own them both, what the hell are you going to do? Yeah. Uh, you could own them both and still pick the wrong one. I'm probably just going a different direction. For me, it's really more about OBJ and Van Jefferson and how you feel about those guys. Yeah. I have just... I've been happily riding the Van Jefferson prayer train since OBJ got to the team. I got a little side action with some buddies of mine as well that Van Jefferson's going to end the season with more targets than OBJ from when OBJ showed up there. That looks like a bet that I might narrowly squeak out. Yeah. I'm very, very comfortable playing Van Jefferson. I'm slightly less comfortable playing Odell Beckham. I think most people are very comfortable playing Odell Beckham yeah. Which camp do you fall in? I fall in a camp where I have to play him because Jalen Waddle <laughs> and Michael Pittman Jr. are on a bye for me this week. But I do agree that both are playable fantasy assets. And I feel like Van Jefferson has a, just a tad bit higher ceiling uh, f than OBJ. Um, we, we've seen both of them kind of get deep ball work the past few weeks. Um but I do think Van Jefferson's really been the one that stepped up into that Robert Woods role for the most part. And like I yeah, heard, I heard a not commentator. really what we thought was going to be the case either. Yeah. And I heard a commentator the other day say like, it took Van Jefferson a few weeks to kind of switch positions to where Woods was lining up, but now he's getting things figured out. And I think that was a good point. So I, I, I really like Van Jefferson rest of the season. Yeah. It's very possible that, between Cup, OBJ, and Jefferson, they all have double-digit days? Yeah. I think it was like that last week. I think uh, you're right. There's no reason it couldn't be like that again. I know the Cardinals are a much different story on defense, but I do think that they're probably going to focus the majority of their efforts on Cooper Cup, and yeah. that's not a reason to sit Cooper Cup. It's just a reason that Jefferson ought to be a little bit more useful. Yeah. Uh, if, if anything else, this is also another one of those games where I'll tell folks, even if, even if you're in a close matchup and you feel like you have to throw a dart at Christian Kirk or Rondell Moore or AJ Green, this is the sort of game to do that in because I don't know that either team's going to run the ball well. The Rams are certainly going to be banged up on the rushing attack. The Rams have a solid enough team up front to stuff the run. Yeah. That I don't know that James Conner is just going to run wild all over them. 
And if two teams in a dome that need to win a game are going to struggle to run the ball, you're going to see a lot of passing attempts, a lot more offensive snaps for both teams than you would normally see. Like this strikes me as one of those games where it might start at 815 on Monday night and might still be going on at 1130 because there's a lot of stoppages, a lot of touchdowns, a lot of plays. And anytime you got to kind of go fishing, you want to do it in the best possible pond. And if each team is going to run 70 plays, in this sort of game, you got a lot more opportunity to succeed than you would in, to be fair, a Bears and Packers game where the ball might be on the ground in bad weather the majority of the game and you don't see a ton yeah. of offensive plays. So if you got to throw a dart, there are some options to do so in this game, just not ones that I'm comfortable going full prayer on. Uh, outside of that, I hope everybody gets uh, – a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of advice to carry forth into a very important week. If you're out there fighting for a playoff spot, we hope you get it. If you're fighting yeah. for your first round buys, we hope you get it. If you're in the playoffs, we hope you crush your competition. That's what we are here to help with. As always, you can find our material at JWB on Twitter. You can find me at jwell underscore ff, Tony at it's just fantasy. Uh, the website is jwbfantasyfootball.com. Tony, what day will you have that start set article that you keep referencing up this week? Uh, I'll have that out tomorrow. So uh, that's right. So plenty of time, plenty of time before your Thursday matchups to, to come recap some more of that info, but a ton of other stuff on there. The dynasty digest with Sky and Weiler or with Skyler and Weiler, really wow. killing it today. Wow. With Wyatt and Skyler. <laughs> woo! Sky we'll, be up, and Weiler. Uh, we'll be up as well. There's a lot of good DFS content that's going to be out as well as some waiver wire articles and all sort of other stuff that we'll have for you throughout the week. So check us out on all the platforms that you can. We appreciate the support. Hopefully we will see some victorious folks back here for week 15 next week. Until then, take care.